Hey guys, so I just want to give you a heads up that if you hear a little doo 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 doo, that's my new pet bird <laughs> that we rescued called Tutu. So if she flies around or if she makes a little bit of a sound, you'll totally know what that is and not just like a small model train behind me. But um, let's get to the episode today. This houseplant home tour is brought to you by Green Chef, which is a USDA certified organic company with dishes for a variety of lifestyles, including vegan, vegetarian, paleo, and keto. Okay, this is the Green Chef one that I've been holding out for. Uh, this is the creamy pea risotto. And I have to give a talk today and really didn't want to have to deal with uh, lunch. So this is a really good, nice option for me and it's gonna be really nice and hearty and gonna carry me throughout the day. Green Chef is owned by HelloFresh as well. So I often go back and forth between their offerings. But Green Chef has a wide variety of organic produce and even offsets 100% of their carbon emissions and plastic packaging. And after a long day of working, I could sometimes get into a recipe rut and I'm frankly too tired to go to a restaurant. So these boxes are a real treat because they are super straightforward, the recipes are easy to follow with pretty photos, and definitely give us some delicious dish options that are delivered right to the doorstep. That's a total bonus when I'm out on the new homestead too because there's not much else around. So go to greenchef.us and use code SUMMERRAIN100 to get $100 off plus free shipping on your first box. So some of you may recall that uh, I did an episode explaining why snake plants, like this one here, got moved from the genus of Sansevieria to the genus of Dracaena. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I'll link to the video here. But I figured it's a nice time to do another video like that because Let's face it, taxonomists are always moving around the classification of species, especially in the last decade or so, because there has been a lot of advances in molecular phylogenetics and gene mapping. Therefore, a lot of our favorite plants that we knew as one name have been recently moved into another genus altogether, like the Sansevieria, for instance. So I thought today we'd tackle the very large genus of Senecio, because in the last number of years, we've seen some of, I would say some of our most notable house plants that used to be known as like Senecio moved into a number of other genera. So most namely uh, Kleinia, uh, Curio, and Caputia, but there's been a number of others too. So case in point, this one is string of fish hooks or string of bananas, you might know this as. This was Senecio radicans, it's now Curio radicans. Then, uh, you know, in the same genus, you have this, which used to be known as Senecio raulianus. You know, this is like string of beads. This one's the variegated version, obviously. And now this one is known as Curio raulianus. Then you have something that is also quite popular. Senecio haworthii, this is commonly known as cocoon plant for obvious reasons. And this one is known as Caputia tomentosa now. Then you have Senecio scoposus, formerly known as Senecio scoposus, and this is now Caputia scoposa. And then one of my favorites, Senecio medley woodii, and this is now Caputia medley woodii. And then also, this is one of my all-time favorite hanging basket plants, actually. Um, this one's actually starting to get variegated and I see some mealybugs, so I need to deal with this. But this is a Senecio jacobensii, and this is now known as Kleinia petrea. And then I have this one. It's kind of a freaky deaky one. This is Senecio vitalis. Um, this is known as mermaid's tail, so this is a monstrous version. I saw this on eBay and I'm like, ooh, that is so nice. I had it saved for a while and then I didn't quite, quite um, you know, act on it. But 
because I was doing this episode, I was like, oh, it'd be kind of neat to actually get this one now. So this doesn't typically look like this. This, like I said, is a monstrose version. This was known as Senecio vitalis. It's now Kleinia uh, talanoides. I think this is subspecies cylindricus. So that is one. And then Senecio fulgens, which I love the flowers on this. This has like nice red pom-pom kind of flowers. It used to be known as Senecio fulgens. It's now known as Kleinia fulgens. And then I think I'm missing it. I have this uh, Senecio mycanoides, might be in the back, um, but that's also known as Delaria odorata now. So I could go on and on. And if you stick around to the end of this video, I'll do just like a quick little comparison and a, you know compilations of, of some of the groups, uh, uh, some of the genera of the plants grouped together. And you could see how maybe their names have changed and if you could see any of the morphological similarities between them. So stick around to the end of the video and I'll actually do that. But for now, let's get more deep into the weeds of this like plant nerdy talk. So there are plenty of plants that are still in Senecio as well, I should mention that. So unlike Senecio, sorry, unlike Sansevieria, that was like subsumed into Dracaena. They didn't like, uh, quote unquote, like do away or get rid of the Senecio genera altogether. So for instance, Senecio macroglossus, this is the variegated version. This is still known as Senecio macroglossus for now. <laughs> so in order for me to explain this more clearly, I wanted to go to one of the experts, uh, Peter Pelser, who is one of the leading scientists who has been working on the reclassification of Senecioni. So I thought I'd share some of our conversation to help explain all the movement within this genus. Actually, if you could just tell me how you you got hooked into the Senecio, you know, uh, grouping anyway, like, did is that something mm -hmm. that you started in uh, university or was it something that you were always like fond of? Well, no, it was not entirely by choice. It was by necessity. Um, when I was uh, studying at, uh, at Leiden University in the Netherlands, I was quite fortunate to be able to work at an institution where lots of people worked on uh, Southeast Asian tropical flora. And I got mm. really fascinated by that. And when uh, I graduated with my master's, I was really hopeful that I would be able to do a PhD project on some aspect of Southeast Asian diversity, something really exciting mm. and exotic. Um, uh, but it was only one uh, PC project available, and I applied for that uh, together with a friend of mine. And unfortunately, the friend got the job, the oh. PC <laughs> position, and I did not. And uh, the only uh, alternative was to work on what seemed a really boring group of uh, kind of European plants uh, that were at that moment um, classified in the genus Senecio. Now, I kind of learned to love them along the way during my PhD, and um, it, it turned out to be a group of Senecio that we found to be quite distantly related to what you could call the real Senecios. Mm -hmm. And um, throughout that project, and I were kind of you were you doing molecular phylogenetics there, or okay? Yeah, yeah, that was a molecular phylogenetics mm -hmm. project. So mm -hmm. um, when we started looking into that and sequencing it and trying to figure out what the most closely related species were, uh, we found out that it was relatively distantly related. It wasn't entirely unknown, but um, it got me kind of into gradually expanding that project and kind of getting down too far down that rabbit hole and needing to do something with that. And then I, um, when I finished that project, it uh, turned out that at Miami University in Ohio, they were looking for a postdoc to do more work on Senecio and uh, looking at trying to come up with a new delimitation of that genus and other closely related genera. So started doing that for my postdoc and uh, most of the, the work is kind of, been written um, during that time, although I've kind of continued that on uh, since. So when you first started, what what year was that roughly when you first started to do some of the molecular analysis behind 
Senecio? Um, this must have been in 2000. Okay. Yeah. And then, so, you know, I, I don't know when your last project was, but I'm just like curious how the um, molecular phylogenetics has changed over the last 20 years. Like, has it gotten, I'm assuming it's gotten way better and you're able to sample more debt, you know, uh, genes, I would guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Especially in the last 10 years or so, there's um, uh, really the era of genomics and uh, the so much more powerful techniques to generate a lot of data. In, in the case of the Senecioni E, um, if you look at the generic delimitation, mm. the issue is not so much um, the amount of data, but the complexity of the data that is a mm. bit of the bottleneck here. And uh, also the size of the data you would need in terms of the taxa that you need to sample to solve mm -hmm. the problem. And that's why even though I think recently was might have been even this week or so that a new publication about Senecioni from a kind of more genomics perspective is published, but it still doesn't touch on what really the issue is here. And that is that we're dealing with a very large group. Yeah. Many species in the tribe are about maybe up to 3,000 or so, maybe even. Right. And I think like with the advent of all this like molecular phylogenetics, it's been chipping away at the genus of Senecio, but it doesn't, the the entire Senecio, Senecio what is that, whatever it is, is around 3,000, Senecioni is around 3,000, right? So it's, the, the issue is like, even when if you're doing one study on it, what are you sampling, a, you know, 200 of them at most or? Yeah, I mean, um, the genomics tools are are still quite expensive mm -hmm. and um, also computationally quite, uh, they're quite complex. It's not something you do easily. And also in, in, in the reason why I really haven't gotten into it until very recently is just also because you, we have a very large data set of sequences from particular uh, gene regions that we generated through Sanger sequencing. So, and it's it's been a quite useful data set for us. So that the, the issue is more in terms of adding additional species. And then you want to sequence those same DNA regions so that right. you can add on to that data set. And it's more difficult if you decide to use a completely different approach. But the real issue here is the incongruence. So what you get is if you sequence a part of the nuclear genome and you do a phylogenetic analysis, mm -hmm. you might get a tree that is different from a phylogenetic tree obtained from plastic DNA plastic, sequence yeah. data. And that is something we we got in we got bumped into relatively early on and then started um, looking into more detail. And what we find is that in the Senecioni there has been a lot of ancient hybridization. Yeah, and, and you could you could see that because is there when you look at the phylogenetic tree, is it because you can't quite? It's like this sister group is very close to this sister. It could be this sister group or this sister group, or you just don't quite know where to place it, or what actually happens. Like, what do you end up seeing? To know that what you end up seeing is if you look at the phylogenetic tree and you look at the particular, let's say, genus and its position among other genera, it might be that in a phylogenetic tree obtained from a nuclear data set, um, it might be most closely related to genus A. Mm. But if you look at another data set, it might be more closely related to genus B. And when you first look at the data, you might think, oh, well, maybe there's just, you know, the data set is not strong enough. Maybe the statistical su support's not that great. But in some cases, you find out that the statistical support for both phylogenetic positions is very strong, but yet mm -hmm. strongly conflicting. And that can then be a sign of hybridization, because if you imagine that your genome is, um, is, is, uh, is composed of genetic information passed down by your mom and by your dad, then you have those two sets of genetic information. Now, mm -hmm. if you are a hybrid individual, you might have see the, the phylogenetic relationships of your mom mm -hmm. in one data set, but the phylogenetic relationships of your dad in another data set. And if mom and dad are different species, 
they might have different closest relatives. Mm -hmm. But that hybridization probably happened many, 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 many millennia ago. But you can't really can you, on on the phylogenetic tree. Can you see maybe where that deviation had happened? Yeah. So what you sometimes see is very shallow patterns, things at the species level, where you might have three species that are each other's closest relatives, mm -hmm. and your your focal species is in some analysis more closely related to one number one, and sometimes more closely related to species number two. So it's quite shallow. Mm -hmm. So that must have happened very recently. But what we see in the Senecioni is that our entire clades, entire genera, or even in some case, a clusters of genera are in different phylogenetic positions, suggesting that these hybridization events have um, occurred a much longer time ago. And these hybrids went on to speciate themselves and gave rise to entire new genera over time. And, you know, obviously now, like you said, within the last 10 year, genomics has really advanced. Obviously, prior to this, the genus of Senecio, there was a lot of plants like stuck in that genus. And obviously prior to genetics, people were using, I would say, I would imagine like the floral anatomy to try to figure out like what, what, where to kind of group it. Is there any way that like morphological features um, corroborate what like molecular phylogenetics is showing you at this stage? Yeah, yeah fairly well. Yeah, so um, the characters that have traditionally been used in uh, Senecioni classification are things that often do have something to do with um, with the flowers and especially flower heads. Mm -hmm. So what most people would think is a flower of a member of the sunflower family, including Senecio, is actually a whole clusters of, of, of really tiny little flowers. All right, and then the little, petals. like the petals are something <laughs> completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so what, if you think about a, a sunflower, mm -hmm. right, you, you, you tend to think that these yellow things sticking out <laughs> along the edge, that those are the petals, but the, yeah. the individual petal is actually a separate flower. Right. And that, that's quite fascinating. So you think, oh, one big sunflower is actually many, many, many little flowers. Mm -hmm. And um, what we see in Senecio classification is that people have a look at whether what, what the shape of those flowers is. In some of these groups, you have flowers that are different in the center of a flower head compared to those at the margins. Hmm. Uh, so uh, whether these flag-shaped or strap-shaped flowers are present along the edges or not is an important character. But also what happens around that flower head, what you would call maybe something analogous to the sepals. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're not sepals because it's a flower head mm -hmm. and the flowers are inside, but these bracts mm -hmm. that surrounding mm -hmm. the flower head and uh, whether there are little tiny little bracts at the base or whether it's just a single circle of them, uh, that's important as well. But also characters of uh, maybe more micro morphological characters. Um, the shape of the cells in the anthers, for instance, can mm. be quite important. Uh, chromosome numbers. Okay, chromosome numbers. I know in Ripsilus, they're, they, they were looking at the shapes of the, not only the cells, but the little crystals in the cactus. Is that used at all in like the succulents you've been studying? Um, I think so, yeah. I mean, they look at cell wall thickenings. Mm -hmm in the past, but also I think there are some studies that looked into these kind of crystal-like structures inside mm -hmm. of cells. Yeah. 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 I, so, it's, it's interesting. And I ask, I only ask this because, you know, I think this is really revealing for people because a lot of folks ask me on the channel, like, what are the taxonomists doing? They're, they're like always changing our like beloved house plants into another uh, genus. And so it's really nice to be able to like, just like lift up the skirt a little bit to, to be able to see what's happening. And part of the reason why I asked about the morphological features is that obviously your average person um, is not a molecular phylogeneticist. So is there something that he or she could see and be able to tell um, you know, if something had gotten, you know, from Senecio to Curio, you know, are there some defining characteristics, morphological characteristics that he or she could see that could say, oh, okay, yeah, that's probably more of a Curio than it is a Senecio, for instance. Yeah, yeah, there are some, but it, it, it is really difficult. Yeah. 
it is very difficult. And there, um, yeah, as a taxonomist, what you what you would like to do is to contribute to having classifications that are predictive. Mm -hmm. So what that I mean is that the name of a particular group, let's say the name of a genus, contains all kinds of embedded information that is useful for biologists and for plant growers and, and, and enthusiasts and anybody. And um, but, but, but what is important in that classification depends on your user group, right? Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. go back to the really early days of plant classification, that was often around uses. You know, these are the medicinal plants. These are the plants that you could eat. These are the plants you need to stay away from because they're poisonous. And that is a very different uh, set of criteria for classification that we use these days. Mm -hmm. So now we tend to think um, more along the lines of class, the need for classifications to show evolutionary relatedness. Mm -hmm. So that, because we know that if you know how organisms are related, then you have lots of information that you could use for all kinds of different things. So if you know that one species is related to another species and that one species has an interesting medicinal compound, then having that information that there is a closely related species then might help you to, to see if that compound is present there as well. Yeah. Maybe slightly yeah. different and therefore perhaps showing less side effects if you were used that to treat the disease. Yeah, actually so you, you bring up, that's actually a really uh, interesting uh, topic that you bring up in general, because I think when we were doing the episode on Sansevieria and Dracaena, there had been work done on the chemical composition and how the chemistry within uh, Sansevieria, formerly known as Sansevieria and Dracaena, are actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, that that's maybe another topic, but it's it's like you're kind of like building layers. Like you said, if you're if you're taking the nucleus uh, genes from the nucleus, genes from the plast, like if you're just taking genes from the nucleus, that's one thing. But if you're taking genes from the nucleus and the plastids, and you're looking at the floral structures and you're looking at some of these cellular levels, you're starting to build this layer of like saying, okay, we're pretty certain now <laughs> that this is because a lot of those, like I, my understanding of like uh, phylogenetics is when you're drawing those trees, it's a hypothesis to a certain degree, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but if you start to, you know, really build multiple layers of discovery of like, this plant is definitely related to this plant. You begin to, I, I would imagine, start to feel more confident in your hypothesis. Yeah, you, you become more confident in your hypothesis because your hypothesis is supported by sources of data that are more or less independent. Mm. So th that, of course, is the ideal situation where you reconstruct evolutionary history and relationships and then see, oh, well, hey, that makes sense because all these things that the the DNA tells us are closely related. They're also morphologically really mm -hmm. similar mm -hmm. to each other. They share this particular feature or combinations of feature that is unique to them. However, it doesn't always work like that. And that's what you particularly see with large genera. And that's, in my view, it's almost inevitable that there are some rogue plants in there that just don't follow the rules. Yeah. They're supposed to show this combination of feature, yet they don't. Yeah. But to me, that is the exciting bit, knowing that they are still most closely related to other members in the same genus, yet mm -hmm. show a different combination of characters. That's where it gets interesting. Hmm. Because then, of course, the question emerges, why? Why is that the case? Is there some really strong selective pressure why these plants look different. So that's what we see with Senecio, for instance. Embedded in Senecio are these weirdos. <laughs> well, can you name like one of them, for example? Oh, I'm thinking about um, a genus called Robinsonia. Mm -hmm. It's endemic to the Juan Fernandez Islands in front of the coast of Chile. Only occurs there are a handful of species. They are woody, and if you look at them, they don't like, look like Senecios at all, yet they're very deeply embedded within Senecio. Hmm. So if you um, want to have a classification that reflects evolutionary history and a classification at the genus level that basically tells you just simply by looking at the name, says, well, 
everything that is called senecio is more closely related to everything else that's called senecio than things that are not called senecio. Mm-hmm. Then you have a predictive classification. Then you don't need to know the phylogenetic tree. You just know by the name. Mm-hmm. And, and these classifications are classifications based on monophyly. Now, um, they're predictive, so you don't need to be a systematist. You don't need to know all that DNA hoopla and these phylogenetic trees. If something is called Dracaena, you know that by definition, everything that's called Dracaena is more closely related to Dracaena mm-hmm. than to, let's say, Senecio. Right. Now, if you have Sensiviria and you find out that some Sensiviria species are, in fact, more closely related to Dracaena than to other Sensiviria species, mm-hmm. They got a problem yeah. because then the classification is not predictive anymore. It doesn't tell you anything about relationships. So in this case with Senecio, with Robinsonia deeply nested in it, you would then um, you could then say, oh well, that means that Senecio is no good, and we got to start splitting that further up into monophyletic groups. But if you do that, you end up with an unmanageable situation. I mean, I, when you when I look at some of the 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 trees, I'm kind of like, oh my god! I, I mean, you must have some kind of software to help you with that because it's it's mind bending. Yeah, there's a lot in there. Yeah, so so in the case of Robinsonia, um, I think it's pretty awesome that we know that they're senecios, but they look very different mm-hmm. because that means there's something interesting going on, and this is something that we see. Uh, happening on islands, remote island groups, not infrequently, where um, secondary woodiness evolves. Hmm. So, of course, that makes complete sense because these things, yeah, they live on a remote island group. Right. In the same way, there's also senecios that look really different and have been, and they grow high up in the Andes. And they're placed in genera called Colcythium and Etiolina and Lesiocephalus. Do they now, have a level of succulency, like in their leaves or in their stems, or is there anything that kind of like does uh, marry them morphologically speaking? What marries them morphologically? Uh, you mean with Senecios or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, with the yeah with the with the larger group that you say that the real real weirdos. Like, is there anything that kind of? Uh, that makes them normal? You no, know, yeah, connects them in any kind of way. Or is it really you wouldn't you wouldn't really um like even the flowers, I would say, or the inflorescences or well it's it's kind of a little bit different that makes us decide that makes us conclude that the better mm-hmm. place in Senecio than to recognize them as separate genera. And mm. that is because these genera themselves are not monophyletic. Mm. So what they have, and, and, and um, I forgot which one it is, but, or, or maybe all of them, but it, tends, it seems to be from the DNA data that a particular morphology has evolved multiple times independently in the right. same type of environment. Mm-hmm. And that is these really large flower heads that are kind of nodding and have uh, many more whorls of these bracts surrounding mm-hmm. those flower heads. Now, these are the diagnostic characters for some of these genera, but we do see that they have evolved independently multiple times. So putting them in Senecio makes sense because you could say, well, yeah, they look different, but that's not a surprise because they're just adaptations Mm -hmm. of a typical Senecio to a very challenging um, environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You might look, and I don't know too much about the details of those genera, but uh, you might look at other features, maybe the leaves, or maybe the mm-hmm. you know the, the morphology of the individual mm-hmm. flowers, mm-hmm. or their chromosome numbers, and decide well, actually, you know, they're not that different. We just right. need to look at these plants differently. Right. Sometimes mm-hmm. the, the the characters in plants that we see and are not the ones that um, that are the most important when it comes to predicting their evolutionary relationships. Mm. I'm sitting a li- little bit more towards that. Um, side of being a conservative when it comes to name changes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm happy to sacrifice at the end of morphological diagnosability. And that is what we ended up doing in our Senecio work. Because unfortunately, because Senecio is so incredibly morphologically and ecologically diverse, you can never find any characters 
combination of characters that all the species have anyway. Right. Unless you really narrowly start defining Senecio. Right. So unfortunately, from a um, and and this is where there is a bit of backlash. Um, unfortunately, you end up with some genera that don't have morphologically diagnosable different characters, mm-hmm. and that is the case with Senecio and Jacobia. Mm-hmm. Now, Jacobia, that is what the group that I worked on for my PhD, and that's mm-hmm. kind of how I got into it. That's that group that I mentioned that was placed in Senecio, but then when I started looking into it, found out that it's actually so distantly related. Mm-hmm. If you bring that into Senecio, if you would merge that, so many other genera would need to be merged into Senecio as well. Right. And the genera that are morphologically quite different have yeah. well-established names. And that would change so many names that, you know, I, I probably need to get some private security to keep me my, keep myself <laughs> from being lynched. Um, yeah, and, and that makes sense. That. It, that makes sense because it's like, okay, you're you're so way over here that we have to cast the net so wide that we just suck up all the rest of the genera because all this other gene genera are so more closely related than this one that you're studying that uh, it, it would it would be a total mess. I could see how that happens. Yeah, that yeah. would be just too much collateral damage. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I, I couldn't. I, I didn't think that was a smart decision. It, it, but Not it the, sounds like it sounds like you're making not only like a scientific decision, but also a psychological decision. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's like, how, how do you, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. You think about the ramifications of that, you know, the collateral damage. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's important because ultimately I think it's our responsibility as scientists to, uh, to generate knowledge that's that can be applied in in, in diverse ways. Mm-hmm. Um, if we come up with classifications that make a lot of sense to to a very small uh, a community of people with a very specific uh, with very specific interest, then these classifications don't become very useful. Um, however. Uh, there's so many different stakeholders here is, is that you cannot please everyone. So you're looking, you're looking always for some kind of a compromise. Right. And there's so many different expectations of, of, of what a classification needs to be like. And only in a very ideal situation would you be able to meet all those expectations. Mm-hmm. Classifications that are stable and therefore never ever need to change anymore. Classifications that are predictive. But what is predictive? What is informative? It all depends on what you're interested in. Right. If, even if we go back further in time, before molecular phylogenetics, taxonomy in this group, just like in other groups, was already quite um, dynamic. Mm-hmm. People had very different ideas of how uh, to slice the pie. So it's it's sometimes, and I, I always find that fascinating, sometimes um, if you look at the results of a molecular phylogenetic study and name changes that happen, it, it is sometimes going back to the future a bit. Um, it's a bit where you kind of say, well, hey, actually, I ended up I end up going back to a, a classification that was fashionable, let's say, 50, 100 years ago. In the 1800s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then got, uh, it was no longer used because the stronger voices then um, convinced most to accept another uh, classification. But now we're going right. back. Right. Molecular phylogenetics shows that these old guys were actually right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oops. Sorry. So it's a little bit with those senecios as well. And that's why there are quite you know, a lot of older names of, of genera that weren't used for a while mm-hmm. and now kind of come, come back again. Yeah. What, um, whatever happened, like with the genus Kleinia, is that, is that a more controversial one? Is there still like a lot of movement there? Or um, I thought I read yeah, a paper there is, on that. There, there, there is some movement there and, the, and, and especially of how to chop up that big clade of African succulent plants, whether 
we got some Kleinia in there that have long established, and this piece have long been recognized as Kleinia, mm-hmm. but intermixed in a phylogenetic tree, you find some things that are called Senecio. Yeah. Transferred. Then you have Curio as well, sitting right. aside as kind of a, 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 a side clade. Um, should we recognize that or not? And then the other day, I got contacted by uh, David, David Mabberley, and um, he's, a, he's a, a prominent taxonomist, uh, also with an interest in, in succulent plants. Mm. And he asked my opinion about some new generic names that have been coined for uh, hybrids uh, between various uh, succulent genera. Oh, did he ask about... Um... Uh, it starts, there's one that starts with a D that I've seen being used for, I don't, I, it's in, it's in cultivation and I don't know if anybody really knows where it's from, but they call it string of dolphins. Do you know that one? No. Oh gosh. I, I have to, I have to find, it's like a, anyway, can keep on going because I, what, what were some of the ones that he had brought across to you yeah uh, how was it again just quickly because it just, just, just i'm going to try to find what this one is so i could i could find while well, you're finding that sure it looks like a curio oh yeah okay so now it looks like it's a curio peregrinus and it was Dendroforbium peregrinum before. And it, it looks like now it's curio slash per, uh, peregrinus, also known as dof, dolphin necklace, flying dolphins, string of dolphins, formerly in Senecio. It's okay. basically like a curio radicans, um, but it's it looks like dolphins. <laughs> And I think it was, it, it's a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw it in Thailand first and then I was like, oh, that's, and then I, then it came to the U.S. Yeah. So, so the, the dendrophorbium has been used for um, a South American uh, group of, of, of Senecios. Hmm. Um you know, the problem a little bit, and well, yeah, it depends on how you look at it, is that um, tribes in Isioni is evolutionarily relatively young. Mm-hmm. And that means that things are messy. Uh, also, in the sense that if you start crossing things that belong in different genera, you know, uh, not, not unexpectedly, unexpectedly then, you might end up successfully with crossing things that in nature would never cross because they're not sympatric. They don't grow in the same area. Right. So um, what has happened is, especially um, among the succulent uh, species that uh, um, amateur botanists are really interested in, people started crossing things and therefore ended up with hybrids between different genera. Now then, the decision then is what to do with that. And Mm -hmm. the issue is that some people decided that these things should then be placed in what is called a notogenus. A notogenus is a genus that is um, of hybrid origin. I thought they're not supposed to do that, though. Like, I thought they were supposed to do, like, you know, the cross. Like, they're not supposed to come up with a whole other genus. Isn't that against kind of like um, (laughs) what? what It's a little bit of a gray area, right? Yeah. Yeah. What what, what are the rules here? If that happens in nature Mm -hmm. and you have a hybrid between two different genera, which we see in the Senecio, that is then the start of a completely new lineage. Exactly. Put a name on it. Yeah. Um, but if you're doing it like, you know, by human hand, I, I thought yeah, you're, you're not so supposed to, <laughs> like gastrolo is not like, you, you, they're not supposed to do that anymore, I guess, is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. yeah. So there are different opinions there of, mm-hmm. of whether you, you should give that thing a name then mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. So I guess David Mabley's um, question was a bit around my, my opinion of whether that is meaningful. And I thought that, first of all, that what was, was done here is that they were over splitting uh, Curio mm-hmm. and then, not surprisingly, end up with all kinds of uh, potentially new 
hybrid genera. Mm -hmm. If you would have left everything in curio, then it wouldn't have been a problem because it would just be a hybrid between a curio species and another curio species. Yeah, exactly. So this is then for me personally then an argument to keep curio relatively broad. Right. So okay, so then how how would the how would the noto genus look? Would it be like curio cross senecio or curio? like what I, I didn't know. So he's he's crossing genera, not crossing like two curios together. Yeah, you'd be crossing uh, genera, and I can't, I'm still looking for the for the for the name of, of that. Um, oh yeah, this is genera. One is called baculellum, and they use it for curio articulatus. And oh. then, so and then they have this noto genus called bacurio, which is then the hybrid between baculellum. And, and and curio. Oh, that's gonna and, be tough. And that's gonna be tough, yeah. yeah. And, and and so they they when they write the name uh Bacurio, mm -hmm. they put that little X thing in front of it to right. indicate that this is a noto genus. Right, right. Yeah. So 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 my uh, my view on it is if I look at Baculellum for curio articulatus, I see no reason yeah. to to lift that out of curio and give that its own name yeah and therefore um i don't see any problem if curio articulatus will be able to hybridize with another curio mm -hmm. in cultivation mm -hmm. so therefore there in my opinion there's no need for the for the name by curio and then mm -hmm. again my decision comes again from the point of view of taxonomic stability mm -hmm. um working on senecios and means that you're working on a group that has um, a long established history of taxonomic research in, in, in Europe mm -hmm. and in Western Asia. And that means that taxonomic tinkering goes back to goes back 300 years. Now that means that you have an incredible number of names available. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the old days before internet and all that stuff, it, it's not uncommon, and especially with widespread species, that the species was described under different names in different places. Yeah, multiple and often, names. You yeah. know, people were not aware of each other's mm -hmm. work. Things were messy. Things sometimes ended up in obscure publications. So we already have way too many names in these senecios that complicate things. So that's why perhaps I'm a little bit like, okay, if we can avoid a new name, let's just please avoid it. Not yeah. even more complicated. Yeah, uh, especially because when you start to get into hybridization, it could continue on and on and on. And then you're going to come up with like more and more and more names. And maybe it's, again, it goes back to that human psychology. Maybe everybody just wants to name their own plant. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, that does come into it. Yeah. yeah, so if we look at those succulents, if we look at the plants of Senecia that are popular in cultivation, what we know is that the succulents as a whole don't form a natural group. The mm -hmm. succulency evolves multiple times independently, even if you look uh, at that in, um, in, in, in the African plants. So we erected the genus, um, what did we call it, Caputia? Caputia, yeah, Caputia, yeah. Because they they are phylogenetically really very different away from those clinias mm -hmm. and those uh, those curios. Yeah. Now, but but looking within that large clade of clinia and curio, and I think there's a few other things there as well. We do see some nice clades that seem to align pretty well with traditional morphological morphology based classifications. Hmm. So there are definitely opportunities there to stick to that as much as possible. Yeah. But the problem is a little bit the more you fall in love with a particular plant group, the more you start seeing differences and the more you are inclined to use a more kind of splitting type of classification. Mm -hmm to kind of capture all these little differences that might be irrelevant to other people into a naming system. Yeah. And then sometimes others looking at it from the outside, perhaps uh, a bit more objective, need to look at that and say, oh, well, let's let's keep let's keep the other people in mind as well. <laughs> 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 we don't want to over split, but on the other end, we also don't want to want to be, be lumping too much. We yeah. want to find that sweet spot that pleases 
um, everyone. Now, that's not always possible, and we do see things like where classifications are quite disruptive just simply because there's just no other way Mm -hmm. um, to end up with something that I would consider meaningful. Yeah. Uh, But often, yeah, what is new is often not so new in a sense that others in the past before the molecular data had that idea already. Yeah, exactly. And that, that involves a lot of research and in in its own right, going back and finding obscure publications, maybe not even printed in your language (laughs) to, you know, to discover, you know, what had been, um, you know, what had been used before. Uh, So I I appreciate that. This is, this is so good. Um, Thank you so much for, for your time on this. So if I could summarize much of what we discussed, Senecio is just a very large group of plants which really has been debated for time eternum. And because there are so many plants in that grouping, it makes it really unwieldy to study. And then when doing the molecular phylogenetics, you, you want to be able to compare to the past work of many of the other botanists who came before you, but There have been so many advances in molecular phylogenetics that you have to kind of like, I don't know how to describe this, maybe downgrade or like backtrack on the technology to do those exact comparisons. Otherwise you're like comparing apples to oranges. You know, so basically if you're taking some of the genes out of the nucleus and you're trying to compare that to ones that have been um, taken from the mitochondria, you're not going to get those exact comparisons. Now, part of the reason why many members of the Senecioni don't quite fit into like perfect phylogenetic trees is because it's believed that there has been quite a lot of ancient hybridization over the course of time. So if you think about the evolutionary history of uh, Senecioni, over time, they might have like gotten together or crossed paths and then they crossed and they might have crossed again and they might have bred back into their same species. So it could be really confusing. And that has led to plants that maybe don't quite fit into neat little boxes. And then you get these incongruencies in the phylogenetic trees, depending on what parts of the genes that you're actually studying. Now, one of the questions I had asked Peter in this interview was if we could tell what plant goes into what genus by morphological features alone, And the answer was like, (laughs) more or less, kind of, sort of, but not really. And the reason for that is there are challenges because what botanists have been using, aside for DNA, is just really some microscopic characteristics, including crystals in the ovary wall. So that's very similar to what scientists were using Uh, to tell Ripsalis apart. So if you recall that episode we did, and if you didn't, I'll just actually link to that one here so you could see that discussion as well. Then of course, there are differences in the capitulum. Now, if you haven't heard capitulum before, that's just the the dense, flat cluster of those eensy teensy flowers or the disc florets. Like if you think of like the daisy, which is in the same family, then you would uh, know what I'm talking about. So this is a a dried capitulum. It's really hard to see, so I'm sorry about that. I'll throw another image up on the channel. So this one's uh, the dried one, but they kind of look like, I described this one, the uh, Kleinia fulgens, as like a red pom-pom flower. So that's the eensy teensy flowers that I'm actually talking about. But, you know, that requires actually looking under this like really high-powered microscope, and then you have to have this keen eye to know even what you're looking out for. So honestly, for the average houseplant enthusiast, it, it just remains really cryptic and out of reach about you know, which one goes into what genus. But I'm going to bundle up some of the species together so you could see what I mean by maybe looking at the morphological characteristics and guessing what, kind of, uh, what genus it actually goes in. And again, like I said, these genera are always changing. So this one I'm gonna feature because I had already mentioned it, but this used to be, again, known as Senecio. Now they're in Curio. And I like the word Curio. I like the genus Curio because it kind of seems like a a curiosity or whatever. Now this has become a group of about um, 18 different species. And you can see they have more of this um, creeping or maybe sprawling habit. 
I have a really large Senecio rhyolanus in uh, my home in Brooklyn, so I'll have to show that one to you. So yeah, so it's they, they kind of creep over rocks and everything along those lines. Now this one is totally threw me off. Um, this you'll know as string of dolphins. This is a nice little cutting of one. And this one, when I did it in 365 days of plants, I knew it as Dendrophorbium peregrinum, which is a South American species. I brought this one up to, to Peter. And this one is an intergeneric cross. So they're now referring it to as Baucurio, which, you know, I don't know if that's going to be the final name. It used to also be known as Senecio peregrinus, but you know, again, what is the name of this? Um, you know, I do think that it kind of looks more like the, the curio species and has that sprawling habit. So to be determined as to what that one is. <laughs> then there are some uh, Kleinia, which comprise of about uh, 55 species. And, you know, this one I think is the one that looks the most unusual, the Kleinia petraea but then you have these Kleinia as well. So you get a sense of just, you know, what the Kleinia is starting to look like. And then this one is, used to be known as Senecio barbertonicus, but this is now Kleinia barbertonica. So you get a little sense. Um, then you have Caputia, which is really the smallest group with only about five species. And I have three of them here. And this has more noticeable fuzz on the leaves. You could see that there is um, some succulency or semi-succulency in these. So you get a sense that they look a little different, I guess, morphologically speaking, if you're just looking at the leaves. Of course, like none of these are have any fresh disc florets on. So you really can't compare them that way and I can't show them to you. I would say that there will obviously be, be more and more movement in this genus as time goes on. So I really wouldn't be surprised if I'm doing some type of update video down the line. But for now, I trust this has helped clarify why many of our beloved Senecio have been classified into a vast array of different genera. As always, we love your support on this channel. So if you like the discussion of all this like plant nerdy talk, then give the video a thumbs up and you can really help give Botany a boost by subscribing to the channel. I mean, there's not many places where you could have long form botanical content than you can on YouTube. So if you wanna support, that's just one of the easiest ways that you could do that. And we always look forward to your kind comments too. So feel free to let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you have something to add to this discussion, then also feel free to add that to the comments below. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye. If you're looking to up your plant game, then check out our suite of courses and offerings, including Houseplant Basics, Troubleshoot Your Houseplants, the 125 Houseplant Care Spreadsheet, and the Houseplant Masterclass. The courses provide you a certificate of completion when you're finished and a wealth of information that you could use to impress both your plants and your friends. More information can be found over at homesteadbrooklyn.com. And if you're seeking more information about gardening outdoors and homesteading in the country, then check out our new channel over at Flock Finger Lakes. See you there.